whom I've always looked up to, who follows me in the rooms, and I need to tell you, I still look up to him. I need to tell you, he brings tears to my eyes because for a long time, it was hard for me to enjoy my recovery because he was still suffering. I'm talking about the pain when you're recovering, but you left somebody out there. Might be your brother or sister or father or mother. Or, 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 or a child, or a dear friend. So yes, he's long-winded, but I love him to death. I need to tell you, I feel good, good, good. And if you too feel good, hug somebody. Basic text, page 88. Recovery becomes a contact process, and we lose the fear of touching and of being touched. We learn that a simple loving hug can make all the difference in the world. When we feel alone, we experience real love and real friendship. The reason I ask you to hug somebody is because when I came into recovery, I was taught that humility is vital to recovery. I was taught that humility is as important to recovery as food and water are to life. I was taught that humility is not me thinking less of myself, but me thinking of myself less. So that's why I asked you to hug somebody. I want to I wanna digress ever so briefly and get some preliminaries out of the way. First and foremost, I want to thank the Creator. I believe that nothing comes from nothing, and this is really something. So somebody had to make it possible. I think it was God. I want to thank every single person that had anything whatsoever to do with this convention. I want to thank the people of New Orleans. I've been up and down the Mississippi on the notches. Been all over the French Quarter got down here early, and I have been made to feel very, very welcome, loved, and comfortable in the Big Easy. There's a woman from Mobile, Alabama. Her name is Gwen W. She's celebrating two years. Somebody ought to clap for her.
There's a man here named Bobby D from the Swana, small wonder area. He's celebrating three years, y'all. Somebody ought to clap for him. There's another brother from Swan, a small wonder area, named Bruce Johnny Cash C. He's celebrating five years, y'all. I got a spiritual sister here. I call her Gail Women's Rap S. I love her madly. I'm not bullshitting. I really love her. And she has got a nickel, y'all. Somebody ought to clap for her. Back where I come from, we have this thing we call a shout out. That's when you're somewhere, but you want to say something to somebody, but you're not there. So you do it via telephone, radio, or something like that. I want to give a shout out to Thomas P. I want to give a shout out to Nilsa L. from Brooklyn. I want to give a shout out to my sponsor, George B. And his lovely wife, Nancy, who hailed from New Orleans. And I want to dedicate, dedicate what I have to say to the brothers at the Gander Hill Prison, the key program. Now, I don't know how many of you believe in magic. I don't know how many of you can see something and it's, and it's an illusion. But if you don't believe in illusions, believe this. You're looking at an illusion right now. It looks to you like there's a man standing up here and a sign language lady, and that's it. But I'm not up here by myself. I'm up here through the love, caring, sharing, and support of a beautiful woman named Laura P. Somebody ought to clap for Laura P. Stand up, woman. I'm almost finished with all of the uh, preliminaries, but um, they asked me to come here and unmask the me in 93. And uh, to do that, I have to be me. And there are times when I curse. If anybody is here with sensitive ears, if you have small children, Here's your opportunity. <laughs> now listen, listen. I have a wide vocabulary. I mean, I don't want anybody to leave here and if somebody says, did you, did you, did you attend the uh, banquet? And you say, yes, I did. And they say, well, what was your um, impression of the banquet speaker? I don't want anybody to leave here and say, oh, rarely have I heard such a beautiful exposition of the vagaries of addiction. <laughs> With particular emphasis on the Narcotics Anonymous modality of recovery. Except for an apparent inability on the, on the part of the speaker to avoid a, the propensity to prolifically profanate his English. You know I curse when I curse because I mean to do precisely that. I was riding back from an uh, anniversary for Shelley in Baltimore, and uh, it was me and Harold J. And, uh, and another friend of ours named Joe. And, and Harold was in the back, see back seat, sleep. And I was in the front seat, the shotgun, passenger seat, nodding. And uh, Joe was driving, and, and, and the traffic got congested. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard all oh, fiddlesticks. Hey, as how? It woke me up. I thought he was pointing at a restaurant or something called Fiddlesticks.
So I'm just saying I curse, come from a long line of curses, took great pride in cursing. <laughs> we didn't say, God damn it. We said, God damn it. You understand what I'm saying? We didn't miss the bus and say, oh, smooch my booty. We said, kiss my ass. I missed the bus. So as I stand here, I can't stand up here and stand for non-existent virtues. You ask me to come here and unmask the me, and to do that, I must be unfettered. I must be able to just flow, you know, you know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm going to do. All right. Now listen, I want to begin. I want to begin with a, with a story. I like this story. I like this story. It helps to loosen me up. This is a story about two characters. One was called the truth, and the other was the lie. Tight buddies, good friends, the truth and the lie. And uh, they hung out year round. And even in the summertime, when it got real hot, one summer they were hanging out and it got real, real hot. Real hot. And they were out in the country. So they got the bright idea, they said, let's go swimming. Only problem was they didn't have any swimming trunks. So they went what we call skinny dipping. They went swimming in the all together, so to speak. And they swam, and they swam, and they swam, and they swam. And when he got tired of swimming, the lie got tired before the truth did. So he brought his lying ass out the water. <laughs> but when he did so, he put on the clothes that belonged to the truth. And he was dressed up like the truth. And he went on into the town. And when he meet people, they said, hi, how are you? What's your name? He said, I'm the truth. And he'd go into a hotel, and they said, name, please. And he, they said, last name. He said, truth. They said, first name. He said, naked truth. He said, middle name, nothing but the truth. He went all through the town just lying and charging credit cards and did a whole bunch of stuff in the name of the truth. And he, and he sounded good and he looked like the truth. And I know all of us can relate to something looking so good, sounding so nice really makes you buy into the fact that what you're seeing and what you're hearing is the truth. But the town people were agitated. Somewhere deep down in their gut, they just didn't feel right. They said, it, well, what do you think about the, the, the truth? Truth seems funny to you. And then they said, well, it, well, it looks like the truth. Say the truth must be the truth. But people just didn't feel right. And the longer the lie walked around as the truth, the worse people felt. They started having meetings so they could talk about how the truth just didn't seem right. And they got real worked up. And then one day, one day when they were all worked up in a lather, getting ready to do something to the truth, a little boy shouted out, wait, wait, look. Down the street was walking the naked truth. <laughs> and it's a funny thing about the naked truth. What the lie dressed up as the truth couldn't convey, shout from the mountaintops, the naked truth could say in just a whisper. And people knew they were hearing the naked truth. So I've been asked to come here and unmask the me in 93, and I'm going to talk about the naked truth. I want to talk about the fact that there's a real serious reason why I've always had difficulty unmasking the me. 
One of the first things that made it difficult was I never knew who the me was to unmask. I was very well versed in wearing masks. You know, mask is another word for persona or personality. I had a lot of different personalities. Whatever personality you wanted to see, I had it for you. As a direct result, there was no me for me to unmask. And there was a reason for that, too. And the reason for that was that I'm a spiritual being going through a human experience. I'm an individual expression of the attributes of the creator. I'm a singular point of God consciousness when I'm on my mark. But I didn't know that. I didn't know that the creator lived, moved, and had its being in me. And when I grew up, where I grew up, I didn't get taught that. I didn't know anything about spirituality or anything closely approximating it when I grew up. Came from a large family, 13 of us. Had a real good churchy type mother. The type who whatever hit you just said, boy, just pray. I had a father who was a professional gambler. His philosophy was, go to school, get all the education you can, get a good job, make all the money possible, fuck every chance you get, and then you die. <laughs> now, with a philosophy like that, you can imagine you can imagine all the havoc it created in my young behind. From early on, my earliest recollections were that it was preferable to put on a mask because everybody that I saw masked up. I never met people with self-acceptance until I came to Narcotics Anonymous. When I grew up, we weren't even looking for self-acceptance. We were trying to find plain old regular ass acceptance. I can't even, time doesn't even permit me to stand before you and let you know all the things I did, all the places I went, all the people that I used and used me, all in the name of just plain old regular acceptance so that I wouldn't feel rejected, so that I wouldn't feel abandonment so that I wouldn't feel any sense of loss, lack, limitation, and deprivation. It's hard to feel loss, lack, limitation, and deprivation if there's nothing inside. I'm talking about being a spiritual being, going through a human experience and not even knowing it. It's very, something very devastating happens when that's the case. You become your own God. You develop the habit of crossing over into God country. You buy into the proposition that you are a power greater than yourself. You get hooked up into things like sheer willpower. I can stop anything when I get good and ready. Everywhere I looked, I saw insanity. Everywhere I looked, no one liked themselves. Everywhere I looked, there was nobody working an inside-out type of program. No one was working internally. Everybody was working on the exteriors. It was all about what you had, who you knew, what you wore, what you drove, who was on your arm. Everybody was validated from the outside in. And everybody believed in never let them see you sweat. 
I seen people get knocked out and on the way down say, ain't hurt me. <laughs> so that's my earliest recollection. My earliest recollection, uh, uh, my earliest recollection was that I, I was dissatisfied. I mean, there was a time that I was serene when I was real, real small, real, real little. I was serene. I was serene, a serene little boy. I was serene. When I'm talking about serenity, I meant that I didn't have to, I didn't have to have anything other than me to make me feel good. I could just play and be happy. It didn't last long. It didn't last long. I started going outside of my house, and when I went outside of my house, I got into a very dangerous habit. And habits are important to study because early in life, man makes habits, and later on in life, the habits make the man. I started developing some dangerous habits. I got into the habit of comparison. I went to your house and saw what was going on in your house, and I compared what was going on in your house to what was going on in my house. And, and all of a sudden, what was going on in my house wasn't good enough for me anymore. I started going over to my little friend's house, and, and, and I saw things that we just didn't have, like choices. You understand what I'm saying? The, my, my little friend's mother would say, little Ronnie, are, are you hungry? I said, hell yeah. You know? And uh, they said, well, uh, what would you like? Would you like uh, salami or bologna? I said, what you mean I could have salami or bologna? <laughs> it, I mean, it was deep for me because back in my home, we didn't have those kind of choices. I didn't want the friends to come for any reciprocation. Don't come to my house. I'd make up all manner of excuses. Why? Because we didn't have choices. We had peanut butter and jelly. And I was even embarrassed about that. Because we had the, the, the peanut butter in a big silver tub, a no-name brand X ass, hard, crusty <laughs> peanut butter with oil on the top. It was, it was just so hard, you, you had to give it a jump start. You looked like you was dancing and shit. You know what I mean? And when, and, when, and when you finished, you didn't wind up with anything that remotely resembled a sandwich. <laughs> the best you could hope for was like a peanut butter jelly ball that you kind of mush, <laughs> mushed it together and eat it. Non-discriminating ass peanut butter. Didn't care whether you used pumpernickel, whole wheat, Italian bread. Gonna rip your bread up. And I used to ask my mother, I said, well, what about things like Little Johnny? Little Johnny, I'll go over to Little Johnny's house. Little Johnny's mother, give me choices. She said, no big deal. You can have choices. You don't want peanut butter and jelly? It's all right. Just go over there and hack your little ass off a big piece of that cheese. No name cheese. Welfare cheese. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like what was going on. I didn't like the hand I had been dealt. I liked the idea of putting on masks early. I didn't like what I was seeing. I didn't like what I was feeling. So I, I bought into things like fantasy. Used to watch a lot of TV. I used to watch a lot of cartoons. Spent hours watching cartoons. But I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. So I brought my perceptions, warped as it was, to the cartoons. When I looked at the cartoons, I saw what I thought was going on in my community. So if I was Little Ronnie watching Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. dwarfs. I saw a little freak on the host stroll. 
with seven little tricks. <laughs> Snoopy and Sleepy and Sneezy. You know Sneezy was at it, right? And, uh, <laughs> sleepy too, that's right. I saw Goldilocks in the three beds. I saw somebody committing a B and E. Broke into the three bears house. Cold blooded at it. Tried the hot porridge and the cold porridge, then hooked up a porridge speedball and went upstairs and nodded out. Yogi Bear was a ripoff artist. With his co conspirator, Boo Boo. But the character I liked, the character that I really truly related to, was Papa. I, I, could, I could relate to Papa. I believe that Papa was an addict. I, I believe that. And I could relate to him because Papa, Papa, he wasn't like a super. He didn't have a cape or nothing, you know. And for 90% of the cartoon, he caught hell. You know, just like the sign ladies are going to take turns coming up here. That's how they used to do on Papa, Brutus and Pluto. Used to take turns whipping that ass. And then he'd get tired, and he'd do what we do. He'd surrender. And he'd, he'd, he'd go into surrender mode. And you could tell when he was getting ready to go into surrender mode, because he'd let you know. He said, that's all I can stand. <laughs> Shit. He said, I can't stand no more. I said early in life, man makes habits. Late in life, the habits make the man. And so Popeye would go into his stash, and he'd come out with a green leafy substance. <laughs> and Popeye bust the move. And then, and then, check this out. Popeye take that spinach and smoke it in his pipe. Papa was smoking that spinach. And he'd get his spinach hit and he'd be good to go. He'd start kicking ass. Little skinny ass olive oil start looking good to him and shit. He start talking shit to her. He start saying things to her like, well, blow me down. <laughs> yes, sir. I ain't gonna repeat that because she up here saying I ain't never coming back here again. Right, right. <laughs> but anyway, I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to pay the picture for you. I'm trying to give you an appreciation of the fact of just how easy it was for me to put on masks. I told you I came from a big family. You know, we became we 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 love putting on masks. We practice putting on masks. You lost your license? Fuck it, use mine. I recently had to park my car. I parked it and people asked me, they said, uh, Ronnie, what, what's wrong with your car? There's nothing wrong with my car. It's just time for me to get a license. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I got tired of uh, police pulling me over and, 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 and I'm sounding like this echo and they said, uh, your name? And I said, my name? Because <laughs> I had to think who I was. 
They said, what's your address, sir? I said, what's my address? Because I had to think where I lived. What's your date of birth? My date of birth? Ain't it on there? I got real, real practiced in wearing masks. I remember growing up, uh, uh, I started fathering kids, masquerading as a father. I was no kind of father. I was a poor, sorry excuse for a father. But, but, but I stuck my chest out, and, and, and I proudly told you how many kids I had but I was a poor, sorry excuse for a father. I remember masquerading as a husband. <laughs> poor, sorry excuse of a husband. The kind that would run in and sign the Christmas cards and uh, ask questions like, what did we get them? Because <laughs> I surely didn't know. And, 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 and the whole thing of it was that as I grew up, uh, uh, I got real well versed in just masquerading and, 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 and wearing various masks. Um, um, there's, there's a book out called Sybil. There's another one called The Three Faces of Eve, and I relate to both of them. Um, even though they, they involve female protagonists, uh, I relate to both of them because of what they're talking about. They're talking about multiple personalities, which again, like I said, is just another way of saying multiple masks. And, and, and I related to them because, you know, the older I got, the more tired I started to get in terms of wearing all of these masks. You understand what I'm saying? I, I just started getting tired of, 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 of showing you one person, showing them another person, acting as if over, over there, and, and just being a whole bunch of people. And it was just like that old saying, will a real Ronnie please stand up? And sometimes I remember waking up and saying, w which mask are you supposed to wear today? Are you supposed to be a father man, a brother man, down with the movement? Are you supposed to be a spiritual man, a professional man? Which, which mask are you supposed to put on today? Because I was trying to be all of these characters, father man, brother man, spiritual man, uh, working man. Uh, and, 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 and what aggravated it even more was the fact that as it talks about in the basic text, most of us did not see the progression happening. I didn't see it. So while I was trying to play out all of these other roles and be a father man, spiritual man, brother man, all these other men, there was another character created I call him Attic Man. What could he do? Attic Man was a bad motherfucker, man. <laughs> he could leap over abandoned buildings in a single bound. <laughs> he didn't eat, sleep. Fuck, did do none of that. And he started wreaking havoc in my life. I used to have to try to play all of these cute little games to try to outwit him, which was difficult, which is, if you could picture it, much like a dog chasing its tail. Me trying to outwit this attic man. But I used to try it anyway. I used to do insane things, like try to hide my money from me. Yeah, I did it. I tried to hide my money from me. Used to take little envelopes and do stuff like, like put some money in it and, and seal it up. Ain't that a bitch? Seal it up and, and then right on the outside, rent. And then underneath that, I put most important. I'm not gonna mess with the rent. Then on another envelope, I put some money in and I put gas and electric. That's right. I'm not going to be in the dark. I've seen those addicts in the dark. That's ridiculous. Wasting all that good drugs, not me. Then I take another one. I put telephone. Another one. I put food, most important. Then I, and I go right on down the line to things like miscellaneous. And old addict man jump out. He said, you better open up one of them motherfuckers. He said, you gonna open up one of them or we gonna open them all up?
He said, and you know, once I get started, I can't stop. We could talk about cunning, baffling, and insidious. Because, you know, I told you, addict man knew everything I knew. So he would use logic and argument and and suasion on me. He said, how long has it been since you used? I said, it's been three days. He said, "Mm mm-hmm. And they said you couldn't stop. He said, personally, personally, I always knew you could stop. And now, since it's quite apparent that you can stop when you want to stop, let's go get one. Tore my love life up. Was a time I considered myself a bit of a Rudolph Vaselino. (laughs) No, I ain't gonna bother Keith P. And, uh, you know, some sort of suave bowler kind of character. I don't know. And, um, and, um, I don't want to get too graphic, but I remember going to, to uh, like the Shady Rest with whoever. And uh, I'd say things like, go on in there and, you know, get ready while I do a little something. Because we're going to have a good time tonight. And then I'd proceed to do a little something. And then the lady in question would come out. She said, I'm ready now, Daddy. Attic man would say, you might as well suit the fuck up. I don't know why we brought your broke ass here in the first place. You got no drugs. You got no money. You ain't no help. I remember, I remember masquerading behind social acceptability. I wasn't stupid. I was just sick. I could get good jobs. I went far educationally, but I I couldn't stop using. You understand what I'm saying? By profession, I'm a lawyer. I used to leave whole juries in the box. (laughs) Fuck them. (laughs) Judge would say, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're just about at that lunch break hour. Why don't we all try to reconvene back here at, oh, let's say 1.30. 1.30, everyone. Please try to be on time. Attic man said, we can make it. Let's go to New York right now. Come on. (laughs) Why are you still here? Let's go, let's go, let's go. Not come running in back in, and the judge would be sitting there going... The jury would be in the box, and the judge would say things like, oh, how nice of you to grace us with your presence. (laughs) Would you mind explaining to us why we all had to sit here waiting for your return? But you see, I wasn't returning, Attic Man was returning. An attic man would say things like, would you mind telling me why it's so hot in this motherfucker? (laughs) 
But the point I'm trying to make is that I tried to hide behind social acceptability. I used to have a little boxy Seville. And uh, so I thought I was all that plus tax. Because you see, I could, I, could, I could drive up to the drive up teller. And I used to do that. I'd be knotted up. I have my attache case, and I knew how to say attache. And I'd drive up to the drive up teller, and the teller would say, well, hello, Mr. Professional Man. How are you today? I said, very well, thank you. How are you? She said, will that be the full extent of your withdrawal? I said, I'll do quite nicely. You're new, aren't you? You better get to know me. I'm here all the time. And I'd drive away. And a few hours later, a few hours later, I'd be back. And she said, oh, we're back, are we? I said, yes, 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 we're back, we're back. Ray Charles could see we're back. So would you like the uh, same amount of money again? No, 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 you, 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 some unforeseen contingencies arose. They're gonna require my immediate attention. We gotta get to the bottom of it. You better give me, let's see, two, three, no, five times as much. That's right, because we wanna get to the bottom of things. And I'd burn rubber getting away. Now this time, I'd come back again. I left with five times as much money as the first time, but I'd be back in one fifth the time. Anybody wanna talk about progression? And this time when I'd come back, my high beams would be on. My left eye would be twitching. My tie would be all crooked. My jaw would be, my, my jaw wouldn't stay still. And, and the same little teller, she'd say, um, oh, we're back again, aren't we? Is there anything I can do for you? As a matter of fact, there is. This is what you, could you, um, would you, would you, would you mind terribly leaning a bit closer because I have something to share with you and I'd like you to catch every word of it as to what you could do. Um, this is what you could do. You can do your motherfucking job. Just do your job. Don't be asking me, am I having a nice day? The attic man is out now. He's not cordial. He just wants money. And he wants it now. I used to try geographicals. Got the bright idea. You know what it is? It's the people I'm surrounded by. You know, if I, you know, I bet you, if I could only just find some decent people to get high with, You just can't find people like they used to be, you know? There's just so many problems when you try to get high today. And I think it has a lot to do with the people I'm getting high with. So what I need to do is uh, just take the show on the road and perhaps get high with other people. And, and, and uh, I remember uh, I said, I said what, what I need is really a vacation. And, uh, and uh, what happened was I went to France. I went to Paris, France. And I said, this is nice. Now, this is, this is, this is what I'm talking about. You just, you see, all you needed to do was to get away from those people. Now what you can do is you can clean up, see some sites. And uh, I went with a tour, and they, and they had an itinerary. They had places they wanted to see, like the Eiffel Tower and uh, the French. Just drink wine with everything. If you order some cereal, they say, well, what kind of wine would you like with your cereal? You know what I mean? And um, so at the time, not being in recovery, I didn't appreciate that one was wet and one was dry. Bottom line, they both get you high. And so by the time lunchtime came around, I was drunk like that. And um, so the, 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 the little excursion tour went one way, and lo and behold, Attic Man jumped out speaking French. He said, laissez les bon temps rouler. (laughs) 
He said, pardonnez-moi, mademoiselle, je m'appelle Attic Man. J'ai besoin de petit peu du heroin. Monsieur, s'il vous plaît, s'il vous plaît, ne bouge pas. Avez-vous un petit peu de cocaine? Was wreaking havoc all the way around the world. I remember coming back home, I told my wife when I had one. I said, uh, listen, listen, because we were sitting home watching TV when I had one. And uh, we saw a little commercial and it said, come down to Jamaica, where we love you. Come on down to Jamaica, because the water is blue. I said, come on, girl, let's go to Jamaica. That's what we need, lay out in the sun. That's it. Let's go, let's go. We went on down to Jamaica. I said, yeah, this is just what we need, a little beach, a little sun. And uh, I remember going into the little cabana and came back, and uh, she had these, these little pina coladas. And I said, why did you, why did you order that? She said, look at them, they're just so cute. <laughs> look at the little parasols and the little cherries. What can they harm? I said, yeah, you're probably right. What can they harm? It's a little pina colada. I don't even like drinking. What can it harm? What can it harm? And um, what I didn't count on was that in Jamaica, the same rum they put in the pina colada is the same thing they fuel their jets with. It's that 151 jet fuel. <laughs> so I knocked back one of those uh, pina coladas, attic man jumped out, he said, yes, man. He <laughs> 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 said, my feel real iron now, boy. Thought you were true with me, huh? <laughs> what you think? You think you keep me behind the dumb eight ball with your white sandy beach, your blue water? No, boy. <laughs> now move your pooper clot ass and go get me a nice big fat Jamaican spliff right now. I got tired of wearing masks. It's a bitch when you're tired of wearing masks, but you've worn the mask so long you can't take the mask off. It's really something when you want to get honest and you want to ask for help, but you've, you no longer know how to get honest. You no longer know how to ask for help. I remember begging to get into the rehab. Because towards the end it wasn't funny. A little 25 cent pack of little Debbie's was a whole meal for me. And then I get one of those little 25 cent juices because I was into a balanced meal. I remember begging to get into the, to the to treatment, begging, and, 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 I, and I found a facility and I said, listen, you, you got to come get me right now. If you don't come get me right now, I just won't be responsible. And they said, well, can you call back tomorrow? I said, no, I may not even have a quarter tomorrow. If you must come get me now. And to my great surprise, the man on the other end said, all right. We're gonna come get you right now. I said, say what? <laughs> he said, we're gonna come get you right now. I said, you, you mean as in right now? He said, yeah, right now. You said you wanted help right now. We're gonna come get you right now. I said, well, wait a minute. You know what I mean? <laughs> you just can't expect a man to drop everything. At a minimum, you must give someone an opportunity to tie up their loose ends. What I'm trying to say is here you are today begging for help you, you needed yesterday, but you really don't want it to come till tomorrow. 
because you just might have another major move in you. I was so happy to come into recovery. I was overjoyed to find you people. I had no problems getting a sponsor. I didn't have a problem with that. Sponsor is just somebody reading from a later page that can better help me understand what I'm dealing with at my stage. I didn't have a problem with that. But what I had a problem with was, 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 was with, with, with trust and reaching out and getting honest and dropping the mask. I used to sit way in the back. And if I didn't pee before I came in, I held it. I wasn't walking anywhere in front of you people because I was concerned with image time. Raggedy like that, but concerned about my image and what you might think about me. After all, you might think I'm an addict like you. <laughs> and as raggedy as I am, I'm just kind of checking this thing out. And I remember telling my sponsor, he, I said, um, you know, I was in the meeting and I, and, I, and I had to go to the bathroom real bad. Of course, I wouldn't go. He said, why not? I said, because of the fact that I was afraid. I was afraid of being judged. I was afraid of being analyzed. I was afraid of being critiqued. He said, that's not, that's, that's not fear. That's, that's irrational fear. I said, what do you mean irrational fear? He said, there you were. He said, you went into a room full of loving and caring people and you call yourself afraid. My sponsor was somebody I had used with that beat me into the rooms by about four or five years. And he said, don't you remember when we used to run around Lower Manhattan in New York? I said, yeah. He said, you remember how you, were, you, you weren't afraid to reach out? I said, I would have reached out then, but you, 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 weren't, you weren't around. He said, but when you were out there in the dead world scrambling, using, you didn't have these hang-ups. And one of the things you need to do is you need to be willing to invest in at least an equal, if not greater, amount of energy in your recovery as you did when you were using. He said, because when you were using, if you couldn't find Flacco, you found Paco. And when you found Paco, you said, where is it at? And Paco said, did what you do, man. Go to the corner and make it right. Go to the second abandoned building. <laughs> Rip the tin off the door. Be very, very careful. Go up to the second story. Be very, very careful because there are no stairs. <laughs> Go to the back bedroom. Go to the window where you'll find a plank. Going to the next abandoned building. Walk the plank to the next building, go to the wall where you see a hole in the wall, stick your head in the hole, look up and go yo yo, put your money in the bucket and no short and no single. He said that's when you should have been afraid. He told me things like, don't come in here playing the game that you used to play when you were little, the game of comparison, the game of I coulda, shoulda, woulda. Because every time he gave me a suggestion, I would I'd try to proceed to tell him, you see, see, that don't really apply to me, because you know I shoulda, or I coulda, or if I had woulda. He said, oh, no, 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 we, we can't do it like that, boss. He said, this thing is like finding yourself in a new city, a strange city. You know, the first thing you want to do, like if you wanted to use the uh, subway or something, is you find a map. You find a map that says, with a big red circle in the middle with a big black X, you are here. Now, we don't care really where you want to go in our fair city. All we want to try to tell you is that this is where you are right now. If you want to go over here, take the red line. If you want to go over there, take the blue line. If you want to get uptown, take the yellow connecting to the white. Only thing we are informing you is that you are here. One of the reasons I had a problem dropping masks 
And unmasking to me is because 99.9% of my problems stem from an unwillingness to accept somebody, someplace, some situation or event in my life. I don't want to get with acceptance. Another problem I had when un unmasking to me was that I had deep-seated denial. Denial is deep because it means I don't even know I'm lying to myself. The whole thing about denial is, is if that I could recognize it, then it wouldn't be denial. And I used to run around saying, he said, you need to do this. You need to take a look at this about you. And I say, I know I need to take a look about with, at that, but I'm in denial. <laughs> Soon as I come out of denial, I'll look at that. He said, you're not in denial. If you spot it, you got it. He taught me things like, look, you better get with the fact that you got two problems that you better address. One is a major problem. Because Narcotics Anonymous is a nonprofit society of fellowship of men and women for whom drugs had become a major problem. Major problem. He said, and the reason you try drugs, like it says in Why We're Here, or who's an addict, I don't really recall. It says, the reason we tried the drugs and different combinations of drugs was we were trying to cope with a seemingly hostile world and we were in search of a magic formula that would keep us from having to deal with our ultimate problem ourselves. He said, and if you don't get real and get with you and start unmasking you, ultimately you are going to go back to your major problem. He said, you better take a look at the interplay between those two. This thing starts and ends with you. He introduced me to some steps. He introduced me to the first step. And I need to say that it was very important for me to work the steps with a sponsor. Because once again, I am not a power greater than myself. He told me I had to rid myself of all reservations. I said, well, what is a reservation? He said, a reservation is just simply speculation and doubt. That's all it is, it's speculation and doubt. You hear these uh, suggestions and you begin to speculate and you begin to doubt whether or not it needs to apply to you. And it works how and why. In step one, page 10, it says reservations can be anything. I believe that because we never had a problem with one particular drug, we can still use it or placing a condition on our recovery, such as only staying clean as long as our expectations are met, or a belief that we can still be involved with the people associated with our addiction, a belief that we can use again after a certain amount of clean time, a conscious or unconscious decision to work only certain steps. With the help of other recovering addicts, we can find ways to put our reservations behind us. The most important thing we need to know about them is that by keeping them, we are reserving a place in our recovery for a relapse. And he went on to explain to me, like it talks about in recovery and relapse, relapse is never an accident. And he went on to explain to me the relationship between that and what he had just read about reservations. He said, relapse is a sign that there's a reservation in my program. So I stopped running around with a host of reservations. He put it real blunt. He said, you must avoid people, places, and things. Because in order to get fucked first, you gotta get in position. He said, it's hard to thread a moving needle. You gotta keep going to meetings. You gotta keep doing the things that got you to enjoy this period of serenity and hope that you're currently enjoying. 
He made me take a look at the fact that, that I needed to admit that I was powerless not only over the drugs, but over my addiction. He said an addiction is a pathological or sick relationship to any minor mood altering experience with life damaging consequences. Well that was a horse of an entirely different color. That meant I had to take a hard look at myself. Because I was running around patting myself on the back for having put down certain chemicals. For having stopped certain behavior. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, <laughs> I was substituting anything and everything that I could. I mean, just going crazy. Just going crazy. I only recently got my video privileges back. I couldn't go and rent a movie because I wanted to see everything. Give me this, that, and the other thing. And I'd walk out with a pile of videos like that. Video lady said, excuse me, sir, but I don't mean to be smart, but... Do you work? I mean, because we have a late charge on, on and these kind of things. And then I went and I took, I took, I took and I went and I bought a big screen Sony color TV with cable and remote. And the screen would split into two screens. And then you could hit another button and it pitch it in a picture. And you could hit another button and you had eight screens. Hit another button and you had 16 screens. I stopped watching pictures altogether. I now only watched information bits. I'd watch three seconds of this and two seconds of that. And two seconds of this and three seconds of that. And my lady would come out and she said, what you watching? I said, everything. <laughs> Don't touch nothing. I got in touch with unmanageability. I got in touch with the fact that I needed to do a lot of work on me. And I got in touch with the need for a second step and the fact that I had to come to believe in a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity. Because I had bought into all manner of insanity. I like to talk about different types of insanity. You know, I remember coming in, I had bought into just plain, deep-seated insanity. You know, the type and variety where you just... Um, repeat the same mistake, fully expecting the same result. You understand what I'm talking about? I'm talking about spending all your money. I'm talking about getting paid, getting paid, not even being able to sleep the night before you get paid. Because in your crazy ass mind, your mind is telling you if you stay up, you can make tomorrow get here a little quicker. And the early bird gets the worm. So we're going to hurry tomorrow up, knowing full well the feelings, the feelings, the way in which I'd feel once the smoke cleared and I had spent all my money and doing it anyway, time and time again. And then I had to get in touch with, with, with repeating the same mistake, expecting a different result. There again is the substitution. Substitution, substituting one good feeling for another one. Uh, and then I had to get in touch with um, doing nothing and expecting a different result. <laughs> Somebody in here can, can relate, not working on nothing, not unmasking anything. And if you step to me, t just go on a cliche run. You got to give time time. Why, haven't you found out yet? It's a pace, not a race. Keep the focus. This too will pass. Just go on a cliche run. And finally, ultimately, I had to get in touch with the fact that the most insane thing I could do was to put anybody, any place, or anything before the God of my understanding and expect a different result. One of the things I had lost in my life and in my act of addiction was something that comes to mind when you look at that, that little itty bitty word in the second step where it talks about a power, 
greater than myself can restore me. For me, that word signals the fact that I lost my ability to discriminate. I didn't say any old power because a lot of things can be a power greater than me, and I had to get in touch with that, you know? And I had to get in touch with the fact that when I went on to the third step, what made it such a giant step was that I was making a decision that what happened in my life, if it pleased God, it pleased me. I was making a decision to have sincere prayers. I was making a decision that when I got down to do my knee work, when I got down to pray, meaning what I said, meaning my prayers. When I prayed, God, your will, not mine, be done, meaning it. Meaning it. I remember sailing along in my recovery thinking that everything was fine and all of a sudden I got a phone call and it was a call relating to my youngest son. Now all of you who are parents and have more than one child, I, I mean you know you love all your children, but this one particular son, this was my baby boy. You understand what I'm saying? This was the one that I could really see me in. And this was the one that I was most fearful for. Because I always felt, I don't know where he's going, but he's going to get there in record time. Because I could see so much of myself in him. And, and then I got a call, and the call said that you better come, you better come to the hospital because your son is sedated. He's sedated because he got a hold to a gun, and, and the, gun, the gun discharged, and he killed his best friend. And I said immediately, oh, no, why me? This can't be happening to me. How can this be happening to me? I'm in recovery. I pray. I make meetings. I follow suggestions. How can this be happening to me? And I lost sight of the fact that God gives life and God takes life. And I lost sight of the fact that I'm not here to put a question mark where God put a period. And I got in touch with the fact that my prayers had been lame, petition-ass, begging-type prayers. And I got in touch with the fact that I was really coming out of the not really bag when I prayed. I prayed, God, your will, not mine, be done. And then when his will would be done, I had the curious inability to believe that this could possibly be his will. And I had to go to my sponsor, my sponsors, and I told my sponsor, I said, this and that happened, and so forth and so on. He said, listen, this is what I suggest. I suggest that when you rise in the morning, you ask yourself this question. What makes me think that God's perfect will is not being done right now? Why do you think, Ronnie, that God has nothing better to do than to punish you? Where do you even get the notion that God holds a resentment against you? And then what kind of God do you have that could hold a resentment? God is loving. God is caring. And they talk about that in the steps. The only requirement is that God be loving and caring. And I had to check myself because I would sometimes feel that maybe I was being punished. Maybe this is a test and all of this good stuff. I'd forgotten that my life, my death, my health, my wealth all stemmed from the Creator. And I realized that if I was thorough and sincere and really truly given my best effort in my third step, then I had to make a decision and it became more simple for me. And it became a decision just to be reasonably happy. Because it talks about it in the third step. It says, listen, if you've really sincerely made this decision, you're no longer fighting fear, anger, guilt, self-pity, or depression. You just surrender quietly and let a loving and caring God take care of you. I had to get in touch with that. And I went on to a fourth step. And the fourth step, I started taking a look at some patterns. And the most significant pattern I got in touch with was what is mentioned in the fourth step where it says, we as addicts have a tendency to think negatively. I have a tendency to say, why me? The most important thing I could do was to really bring that third step with me into my fourth step. And when I did that, 
when I was willing to do that, I began to see certain patterns. I began to see just how easy it is for me to beat myself to death. Don't need you to help me. I began to see just how easy it is for me to think negatively. Don't need nobody to help me. Thinking the worst, seeing the worst, no hope, always fearful. I began to see that, I began to see certain patterns. I began to see that the core of my disease was my total self-centeredness. I began to see that the core of that total self-centeredness was fear. I began to see that the core of that fear was the unknown. And I began to see just how sophisticated my disease was, that I was still trying to be godlike. I was still trying to partner with the Creator. I began to see, I began to see that the proof was in the way I lived. If I was thorough and sincere and meant what I said and I was making a decision to be reasonably happy because the spiritual principle behind the third step is willingness. And when I looked it up, it said cheerful readiness. I went back to my sponsor and I went and I took these patterns with me to him and I talked about them and I showed them to him and something real significant happened in my life. For the first time in recovery, I repeat, for the first time in recovery, I had been running around saying I trusted, but I didn't really trust. I didn't really trust. I didn't really begin to trust until I worked that fifth step with my sponsor. Because I really secretly thought that I'd be judged. I thought I'd be criticized. I didn't really believe that someone would love me unconditionally. Until I took that risk in the fifth step. That risk to be intimate with another human being. That risk to be vulnerable. And without risk, there is no vulnerability. And I shared things with my sponsor, and my sponsor shared things with me. And the biggest thing I got out of that fifth step was the ability to trust. And I moved on to my sixth step. And we did a lot of work in the sixth step. We, 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 we really worked with character defects, and we isolated some of the most salient features of them. The fact that my character defects robbed me of my ability to think logically. The fact that my character defects robbed me of my time. The fact that my character defects robbed me of my energy. And the biggest thing we worked on was trying, just trying to imagine what my life would be like without them. And when I did that, that's when I got in touch with the willingness that I needed to move on to the seventh step. And the biggest thing I got in touch with in the seventh step was a new level of humility, a new level of honesty. Because without the honesty, there was no humility. I got in touch with the fact that, once again, I was not a power greater than myself and I needed God. I got in touch with the fact that just because I wanted to be rid of shortcomings, those things that caused me pain and misery, I don't care how bad I wanted it, it didn't mean that it was going to happen. And the biggest thing that came to me out of the seventh step was awareness. Some things didn't change at all, but my awareness changed. My awareness of the need to be humble, my awareness of the need to realize that I wasn't working in Ronnie's time, I was working in God's time. And things that were going to be lifted would be lifted in his time and in his manner. He moved me on to the eighth step. In the eighth step, like it talks about in the basic text, I finally got free of guilt and remorse because I was carrying around a lot of guilt, a lot of remorse over things I had done, over things I didn't do, over things I thought I should have done or would have done or could have done. He got me in touch with the fact that I might have done 99 things to somebody else, but if they did one thing to me, I'd look at that one thing and allow it to prevent me from being willing to take a look at the 99 I had done to someone else. We made up a list and we started addressing these amends. 
I remember, I remember um, I had an out of wedlock daughter and I didn't talk about it. I swept it under the rug. Her mother moved to California when she was young and I thought that she was a delightful mother. God bless her, what a beautiful thing to do. Just move to the other side of the country and leave me alone. But as I came into recovery and I started to grow and my conscience started to, to flourish, I didn't feel comfortable anymore. And I decided to reach out to this daughter and I did that. And the thing about it was she didn't even know that I was her father. And by now she was 19. She was in college. And, and I reached out to her and the whole thing about it was that I really got in touch with what they talk about in the ninth step in terms of timing is essential. Not only is timing essential, but it was real essential that my motives be pure. It was real essential that I was doing the right thing with the right motivation behind it and without a whole bunch of expectations. Because when I got in touch with her and we tried to establish a relationship, she gave me a nice, big, fat, healthy piece of her mind. She said, where you been? Now you want to come into my life, upset in my life, talking this father shit? And by the way, what does being a father exactly mean to you anyway? I'm in college and I'm working two jobs. You gonna be some help? And I said, oh shit. <laughs> this stuff is deep. I can honestly say today we have a beautiful relationship and it's only through the grace of this program. We worked the 10th step and the 10th step, he taught me to check myself before I wreck myself. In the here and now, today, We moved on to an 11th step, beautiful step, a beautiful step where we did a lot of work on, 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 on trying to maintain a conscious contact with the God of our understanding. And by now I had one. By now I had one, and, and, and the whole thing about it was um, he, he, he likened it uh, once I got spiritually in touch. He said it's like when you put God in the center of your life, when you maintain a conscious contact with the Creator, it's, it's, it's much like drawing a circle correctly. In order to draw a circle correctly, you have to find the center. And as you draw the circle, you must keep the circle from moving, the center from moving. If you keep the center from moving, when you draw the circle, you'll have a nice perfect circle. If you let your center shift, you'll wind up without a circle, some sort of rectangle or parabola or something. If you let your center move, your circle won't be well-rounded. If you let your center move, you will find that it's bent out of shape. He said, by parity of reasoning and similarly, if you fail to keep God in the center of your life, you neither will be well-rounded. You too will find yourself continuously bent out of shape. Because once again, I'm a spiritual being going through a human experience. And that's the mask that I really have to drop. And there have been many times in my recovery when I really didn't want to take a nice, clear, hard, solid look at that because I honestly felt that I needed to enjoy some of the things that were coming back into my life as a result of being in recovery. I started to get some trinkets and some baubles and the few little rags to put on my back uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I began to feel like I may possibly have it going on again and yet at the same time I knew it wasn't about that. I knew it! I knew it wasn't about that because that stuff never mattered to me before. As a matter of fact, that was the first stuff to go. 
If I got down to the short hairs, do you like this watch? Can we talk? Everything was negotiable once I got on. Let's make a deal. So if that's if that sort of thing didn't have meaning and it didn't have value to me then, what makes me think it will have the meaning and value now? We talk all the time about getting a better perspective just for today. We talk about carrying the message and the message we need to carry is that as a result of working these steps, we have a better perspective today. I have a better perspective. You give me a better perspective. You sharpen my ability to analyze, to critique. Because on my own, I can't do it. I don't consistently make good decisions. I'm a mismanager. But you help me make good decisions, and the best decisions I can make is to keep God at the center of everything. I want to give a little... I want to... I want to give a little example... I want to give a little example uh, before I shut this down. It was an example my sponsor shared with me, and it, and it related to uh, someone who took a boat ride. Took a boat ride on a sunny day. And all of a sudden, the, the, the water got real, it got bad out. It got windy like it is today. It got windy. The, the waves got high. The sky darkened to jet black and it was thundering and it was lightning. And the guy who went on the boat ride, he got scared. He got scared and he ran to the captain. He said, oh, I think we're going to die. Do something. You're supposed to be the captain. What are you going to do? How can you be so calm in the midst of this storm? Why don't you pray that we don't have a storm? And the captain told him, I said, I don't pray that we don't have a storm. I pray for serenity in the midst of the storm. He said, because as long as we don't let the water on the inside of the boat, the sea will come, the storm will pass, and once again it will be smooth sailing. He said, Ronnie, it's the same way in life. As long as you keep God on the inside, and you don't let what happens to you and around you get internalized on the inside instead of God. Everything will come to pass. And I needed to hear that. And I needed to know that. Before I close, I need to say this. When we talk in terms of unmasking the me, it's vitally important that we realize it's not about the me. One of the things, one of the spiritual awakenings that we get to in recovery is the fact that it is not about the me, I, and mine. It is about the we and ours. There is no unmasking the me without you. I'm not a power greater than myself. We all need each other. It truly does take two hands to clap. This is a beautiful convention. And as I look behind me, and I see this beautiful banner behind me, I've been to conventions that have had a longer history than this one. And one of the things I notice is that you can look around and you can see the banners all around the banquet indicating each year that they had a convention. The fact that you look up here and you only see one banner indicates the fact that each and every one of you are a part of history. Each and every one of you are a part of history. Many people through the grace of God, will go to many conventions for the New Orleans area of Narcotics Anonymous. But only you people right here, right now, will be the ones who attended the first one.
This has been a real treat for me. This has been everything I hoped it would be for me. I'm happy. My family's happy. My children are happy. My friends are happy. East Coast is happy. Jersey's happy. Detroit's happy. Newark's happy. Delaware's happy. And New Orleans damn sure is happy. I'm an addict, my name.